All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Marvin. I've been uh, an instructor in the English department for about four years. Um, thank you for coming to the workshop. I know you guys have many choices with how to spend your common hour, uh, and I thank you for choosing D122 today. Um, so this is a workshop about online courses, and uh, it's become an emerging trend that I sort of start off all of my workshops with a disclaimer about how little I actually know about what I'm about to say. Uh, so this is going to be no exception. Uh, so a little bit of background. I was asked to be the curriculum leader for the English department's online and technical writing courses uh, last semester, which I happily agreed to do. Uh, but the disclaimer is that I've only taught a couple of online courses so far, so I'm still really figuring all this stuff out. And uh, today I want to share a couple of the things that I've learned uh, with you guys. So right now I'm teaching one section of online comp. I taught one section of online comp in the summer. And now I'm also doing a section of tech writing, which is a hybrid course, half online, half on ground. Um, so let me get a sense of the room before we get started here. How many of you have taught online before? Okay, that's pretty good. How many of you have not, but are intrigued? Pretty good. And how many of you have no interest whatsoever? <laughs> okay, that'd be a weird choice to come to this workshop, but that's okay. All right, so that's, that's cool. We have a good mix. Um, so I thought we would just start, seeing as we're probably most comfortable talking about this, uh, let's just start brainstorming a couple of quick ideas about what are our favorite aspects of the traditional classroom? What are your favorite things or advantages or things that you enjoy most about being in a physical classroom with the students? Face-to-face -face interaction. Face-to-face -face interaction. Totally. But my question, Valerie, is so what? Who cares about that? What's that for? Uh, you know, people reading nonverbal cues. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we got faces, we got body language, right? That's right. I yeah. think we learn a lot from each other. Yeah? Okay. What's your name? Allison. Allison, nice to meet you. Uh, what do you mean by that? How so? Um, I like to think that by being in a classroom setting, um, even though some students could write essays or do their homework or classwork outside of class, yeah. it's beneficial to be in a class. Um, you know, that goes with the face-to-face. -face. Yeah, definitely. There's something... Support, maybe a support system? Yeah, for sure. There's definitely kind of an inherent support system when everybody's kind of in the same room, physically in the same boat. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? That's as, it. As teachers, we, we feed off the aha moments when they have them. Yes, the aha moments, right? Those eureka moments, right? Which are super uh, enjoyable, right? When a student finally gets it, right? And you get to do the aha moment, there you go. Right, yeah. Um, Totally. Anything else? Accountability. What do you mean, Joey? I think it's easier to hold people accountable when you're looking them in the eye. Right. You have to make eye contact with the instructor, right, at least twice a week, right, and vice versa. So yeah, I think that's definitely accurate. Anything else? Yeah, that's pretty good. So here's what I came up with. The thing about the traditional classroom is that it's this time-tested model, right? Instructors have been standing up in front of students for a very long time, so we kind of know this works. And it has very clearly defined parameters. We show up at this time, on these days, in this particular room, right? So those constraints are kind of very luxurious, and we tend to kind of take them for granted. Uh, there are also established classroom roles and dynamics, right? So I am the instructor. I am standing up here and communicating to you. You guys are sitting. You are talking to me, right? So there's a clear sort of uh, power or authority sort of system going on there. And like we said, there's a built-in sense of community because we're all physically present in the same room. We have easy access to one another. And all those environments, all those face-to-face uh, -face environment advantages, right? We've got synchronous communication that can happen in real time. You can read facial expressions, body language, tone of voice, right? You can see when the students are super confused, right? Or when they're super bored, right? Um, you can improvise, right? Based on those verbal cues that you get, find those teachable moments, right? Those eureka moments. You can use humor a lot more easily, right? When you're physically up in front of the class. And there's a lot more talking and listening going on, which for the most part, I think we're all uh, more comfortable with to varying degrees. So this list kind of underscores one of the big fears that I had when I agreed to take on the role of curriculum leader for the English department's online courses. And that was, I felt like my biggest strength, and maybe you guys feel the same way, I felt like my biggest strength as instructor was my classroom presence. Right? My ability to stand up in front of the class and bring a lot of energy and make sure the students are having fun so that they stay engaged right? and to kind of carry the energy of the whole group. And obviously online, right, all of that is negated. Right? There is no standing up in front of the class. Right? So all of those advantages that I felt like I had were completely gone. 
Because in the online classroom, it kind of transcends the boundaries of time and space, is the fancy way that I like to think about it. So there is no set meeting time. There is no set location. right? There is no things have to be handed in at this particular time. All those constraints that we kind of take for granted in the on-ground class. There's little face-to-face -face interaction, as we know. And because we're all com uh, communicating behind screens, we tend to kind of feel a sense of isolation or separation, even from one another, because there's no face-to-face -face contact. There's a perception of having limited access to your classmates and to your instructors because you're kind of on your own, right behind your laptop at all times. And it's a screen-to-screen -screen environment instead of a face-to-face -face environment. So all communication is asynchronous, right? It doesn't happen in real time. And it's a level playing field. So everybody kind of has the same voice. So even though we are still the instructors in the online courses, right? It's not like we can type louder than the students, right? As opposed to in the regular classroom, we can stand up here, right? And kind of assume that authoritative role. No facial expressions, body language, tone of voice. And in an online course, it's all reading and writing, okay, which can be very challenging, particularly for our students, because we know that reading and writing are super hard. So this is what kind of informed my, my desire to do this workshop, because I've been trying to think about and trying to figure out how to, how to handle this. So the, the question that I sort of arrived at is, how do we give our online students the same great experience that we give our on-ground students? Okay. This is the question that I've been thinking about. And the answer for me is one of humanization. So I think all the things that we came up with, right, and all the things on the slide, all of these things that we enjoy about the traditional classroom, I think they have one thing in common, and that is there's an element of that human connection, right, that we benefit from and enjoy being in the same room with one another. Obviously, online, that's completely gone. Right? So my question that I've been thinking about is how can we still give our uh, students the same great experience that they get in the traditional classroom even when everybody's sitting behind their own uh, computer? Right? So before we get into some of the specifics about how to do that, I'd like to spend a couple minutes just thinking about why students take online courses and why instructors teach online courses. So I went to the uh, Taika conference in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, last semester, and there was a session put on by Harrisburg Area Community College, and they have 6,000 students enrolled in their online courses uh, just last semester. And so they put on this great presentation, and they conducted a survey of about 5,000 students and 200 faculty members, asking them about their online course experience. And what do you think was the number one reason students decided to take online courses? Schedule flexibility, exactly, right? Which is, makes a lot of sense, especially for a community college population, because as we know, our students have very uh, challenging lives a lot of the time. They have transportation issues, illness, uh, health issues. They've got um, difficult living conditions, right? Things that make it very difficult to get to campus regularly, multiple times per week. So for a certain segment of our population, I think online courses can be a really great solution. Now that survey that HAC also uh, put on also asked the question, why do instructors teach online courses? What do you think the answer was to that? Flexibility. Same thing. Flexibility, exactly. Speaking as somebody who commutes from Farmington four or five days a week to get here, uh, being able to access my students on my course online is a great convenience, right? So all this is to say that we know that there is a demand for online courses, right? And I think that there is certainly potential for student success. I'm not saying that online courses are perfect for all students or that they're perfect for all instructors. But I do think that for a certain segment of our population and for certain instructors, it can really be a great vehicle to help students succeed. And so because of that, we need to know how to do this well. So I want to talk about how we can do that uh, today. Again, giving our students the same experience as our on-ground students. That is an experience that is authentic, engaging, and human, right, most of all. So how do we do this? There are many different ways to do this. I took a uh, professional development course uh, last semester called I Teach Essentials, and it was about nine weeks about online pedagogy, which is way more time than we have here today. So what I'd like to do is kind of sum everything up into four big categories, and those four big categories are be actively present, use quality course design, communicate clearly <coughs> and kindly, and know the technology. Right? So these are the four areas we're going to hit today. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into this, um, but this will give us a good overview. So the first thing is to be actively present. Um, so unfortunately, there's a big stereotype about online courses, um, both from the perspective of students and instructors. Does anybody have an idea of what that stereotype might be? Boring. Boring? That's a good guess. That they set it up. Okay, yes, that, so from an instructor, they might think, yeah, I'll just set this up, wind it up, let it go, right? Yeah. What do you think a student might feel? No connections. 
piece of cake. Very good, Vicky. Yeah, yes, piece of cake. Right? That's going to be super easy, right? I'm just going to I'm going to go on, right? It's going to be completely independent. Uh, I don't have to look the instructor in the eye every week, right? I can do everything at my own pace on my own time. And that is true to a certain extent, but in fact, it's these very qualities that make online courses more challenging, right? Because they require more self-discipline and better time management skills, which the students may or may not have. And as we mentioned, right, instructors are also guilty of kind of having the same expectation. Oh, online course piece of cake, I'll just throw my assignments and stuff on the blackboard, check in every once in a while, make sure nothing's exploded, and boom, an extra $4,000, right? Um, but that's obviously not the case. So, because, that's no good. So because uh, it's an online course, and because there is no face-to-face -face interaction, the students really rely on the instructor even more so than in a traditional classroom. And so they rely on us to follow a schedule, to set expectations, and to make adjustments as needed. All right? And this probably seems obvious right, to those of us who are willing to attend a workshop about this sort of thing. But uh, the reason I'm stressing it is because we want to keep in mind that online courses do not teach themselves. Right? That's kind of like a, um, a stigma, right? that, oh, it's a piece of cake. Right? But in fact, it requires a lot more attention on both uh, participants' parts. So there's no face-to-face -face, face -face interaction, as we know, so it's up to us to define all the parameters and the expectations. So how do we do this? There are a bunch of different ways to do this. I'm going to give you a couple specifics. The first is using regular and frequent announcements. So I post announcements every Monday, right at midnight, to tell the students what is going on in the week ahead. I think posting announcements regularly, consistently, frequently, at the same time, kind of contributes to a sense of ease, and I always know uh, what we're working on at this moment. So announcements are very useful, instead of just one at the beginning and one at the end. Uh, profile pictures and introduce yourself posts. Right? So this is a great way to humanize right, your presence as an online instructor. Because as we all know, on Facebook and Twitter, when you see somebody without a profile picture, it's just that creepy egg on Twitter, right? it's super weird. right? So including a profile picture and making students do introduce yourself posts right, is a great way to kind of make everybody feel like, oh, there are real people that we're dealing with. Another great practice is the Course Questions Forum. This is a discussion board uh, that's open throughout the entire semester where students can publicly ask questions. Um, obviously, in the online course, it's a lot more challenging to raise your hand. So the Course Questions Forum is a good way to kind of collect and compile questions. And because the questions are act, asked publicly, you can answer the questions publicly, and everybody can see the response. And sometimes the students even respond to each other's questions, which is very cool. The cool thing is that once you've done this for a couple of semesters, you can compile these most common questions into a frequently asked questions area or resource. And that way you can point students to that. So you don't have to waste time answering the same questions over and over again. You can point them to the resource so that we can concentrate on teaching. This last one is a big one, to actively participate in the discussion boards. So in my regular classes, uh, I run a very decentered classroom, which means it's very rare that I'm just standing up front and droning on for 75 minutes. Uh, more likely, Carolee knows this because she's a tutor in some of my classes, um, usually I just ask the students what they think about whatever they read or written about and we kind of go from there. So <coughs> discussion boards can be an awesome surrogate for uh, online, or excuse me, for in-class discussions. Um, but I think it's important that the students, the students not only interact with each other and with the material, but with the instructors as well. And so as a result of that, I think that participating in the discussion boards right alongside with the students is a really good strategy. Over the summer, when I taught my first online course, that was the only course I had to teach. So I spent a lot of time in the discussion boards posting and communicating and uh, you know, guiding the students about where I wanted them to go. And this semester with my online course, because I'm teaching four other courses along with it, I've been slightly less active in the discussion boards and I can really feel the difference. The discussions are still good, but I think the students have the best experience when you're kind of right there alongside them, communicating, learning, discussing, and so on. So be actively present. Seems like a challenge because we're behind computer screens, but I think it goes a long way. We want to give them a human experience in our online courses, not just a computer experience. Lawrence Reagan is a uh, PhD who wrote a bunch of great columns about online pedagogy. And uh, one quote that I pulled out of his articles is, in most research examining student satisfaction with the online learning environment, Connected, connectedness to the instructor is frequently cited as the most rewarding and potentially most frustrating aspect of learner satisfaction. So there you go. Even though it's an online course, we still need to show up and teach. Number two, use quality course design. So again, one of the big differences between online and on-ground is that on-ground we're doing a lot of talking and listening in the classroom, whereas online it's all reading and writing. 
And because of that, we need to make sure that all of the information that instructors uh, present on screen to the students is presented in a way that is clear, concise, organized, logical, and so on. So let's talk about some specifics. The first is using gradual content rollout. So it would be super easy to just come up with all your course material over the summer, throw it up on a blackboard, and say go, and let the 16 weeks just kind of roll by with your feet up on the desk. But obviously that would be a terrible experience for the students, right? It would make them uh, feel very overwhelmed, there would be no direction, and there's no sense of unity because the students aren't staying together because they can do everything whenever they want. So if you gradually roll out your course content, sort of bit by bit, week by week, right, it kind of, it's like a, a trail of breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs right, piece of candy. Uh, there's a sense of being guided through the course. And that helps to keep everyone together because it's clear at all times this is what we're working on this week, so everybody stays together, and that's especially important for discussion boards, right, because if people are coming and going on discussion boards over the course of many days or weeks, there's no real discussion going on. So that's kind of a way to combat that sort of asynchronous uh, communication. This also helps with time management because if it's clear that this is what we're working on this week, the students can focus on that one aspect of the course and the rest of their lives can happen around it. I will say that it is useful, and this is something that I'm struggling with so far, but it is useful to build a as much of the course as you can ahead of time and then release it gradually because if you try to build the course as you're flying the plane, as Dean Brinkini likes to say, if you try to build the course while you're teaching it, it um, can kind of be a big distraction because you're trying to get stuff up and post it online, and that allows you to teach uh, less. So prepare everything ahead of time, have it post gradually, right? you can set that automatically in Blackboard, and that allows you to just concentrate on the teaching part as opposed to on the actual building of the course part. So another troubling thing about online courses is that they can be very abstract, right? And because they're very abstract, I think using concrete and consistent deadlines is a great way to make the course feel more real. It's kind of like, uh, you know, when you're in school and uh, you have a lab report, a math test, a history paper, and three chapters to read in the Odyssey, which one is getting done last? Definitely reading in the Odyssey, right? Because it just feels less real than all the other stuff. So likewise, for instructors and students, I think your online course can feel less real because you don't need to be as prepared um, in an online course as you do when you have to stand in front of an instructor or in front of a bunch of students. So using deadlines kind of keeps everybody accountable. Specific deadlines, days and times, right? Uh, and keeping the deadlines consistent, like my discussion boards, for example, are always due initial post on Wednesday nights by 11.59, replies to at least two classmates by Sunday at 11.59. Consistency helps the students feel comfortable, it keeps the course predictable, right, so they always know what they have to do. And again, this allows life to happen around the course. They know the deadlines, right, they're the same every week, and so as a result, they can find the time to do the course as they like. The next thing is to keep your course content organized. Um, it would be, again, very easy to kind of just throw everything into one big area, right, with called course content that's just overflowing with information. Um, but that's obviously very overwhelming. So you can organize your course content into folders, right, weekly, chronologically, thematically, by topic, whatever works best for your course. Uh, but doing that helps the students kind of keep their wits about their, them, right, and not have them be uh, super overwhelmed, lost, confused about where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. One of the interesting thing, things in the I Teach course was uh, we had to do an exercise where we had to redesign documents to make them more accessible, readable, and so forth. So I want to show you a couple of examples here. So this is a uh, document here on the left. Um, what do you notice about this particular document? I know it's small and you can't read it, but visually. Super text heavy. Super text heavy. Yeah, we've got big paragraphs, right? These paragraphs are more than four lines long, so that's really hard to read. What else? Difficult to pull out where the salient pieces are. Yeah, okay, so in these big paragraphs, right, it's difficult to know exactly what the most pertinent information is, right? Yeah, for sure. I think the visual is a distraction. Yeah, right, what is the point of this little piece of clip art here, really? It doesn't have any purpose, right? It's a superf superfluous uh, image, right? Okay, what else? Maybe the colors are distracting? The colors are distracting, perhaps. Yeah, we've got decorative fonts up here. We've got big, long hyperlinks, right, that are, you know, distracting to the eye. We've got inefficient use of white space, right, around this image, and, and so on, right? So this is not good, right? So we had to redesign this document, right, so that it's more accessible. So you can see in the redesign, right, there's a lot more white space. There's a better use of bullets, right? Um, I think you probably can't see the bold or the italics, right? But you can use bold and italics for emphasis, 
right? You've got numbered lists to indicate things that need to be done in order, bolded lists, right, for just a series of items, right? So much more legible, much more readable, much less overwhelming. And it's good, this is better, it's good to uh, keep your document design consistent, right? Because if, say, you've got four essay assignments like we do in the composition classes, if you've got four essay assignments and all of those assignment sheets are formatted in the same way, it makes the students comfortable because they don't have to worry about parsing an entirely foreign document right every single time. They know, okay, Mr. Marvin's uh, assignments always look like this, so they can get right to absorbing the content as opposed to trying to figure out, you know, and visually absorb all the noise that's going on. So quality course design includes document design uh, as well as your actual course content. In short, it's all about presenting information in a clear, controlled, and consistent way. And this helps to avoid confusion and frustration in the students and empowers them to succeed so that they feel like, I can do this, even though it's kind of, there's a lot more independence going on, uh, I can do this and uh, I'll be able to succeed in this class. Hi. You can grab one of those packets right there. Perfect. Uh, so number three, this is a big one, right? Because we're talking about uh, online courses, so everybody's behind a screen. So communicating clearly and kindly is huge. On ground, we kind of take communication for granted. We know that we always meet at the same time, in the same place, there are the same faces, right, every week. You can ask questions before class, during class, after class, and if that doesn't work, you can come to office hours where you can meet one-on-one -on -one with the student, right, and address their individual issues. Again, peers and instructors are physically present, and so there's that built-in sense of connection because you're all showing up to the same room at the same time every day for the same uh, set of six, 16 weeks or what have you. Communicating behind a screen is a little bit di uh, difficult, right? Because, as we know, there are none of those in-person perks, uh, but it does actually have some unique advantages that you might not think of. Uh, the first is that it can actually be a boon for introverts because people who might not feel comfortable raising their hand in the traditional classroom might feel a lot more comfortable typing out all their responses. Um, it can also, sort of paradoxically, it can also increase uh, the camaraderie for the students earlier on in the semester uh, because in the traditional classroom, right, you have, you can see everybody, so you can kind of subconsciously make prejudgments, right, about this is the type of person I want to hang out with. This is not the type of person I would want to hang out with and so on. But again, because of that level playing field online, right, there's sort of um, an inherent camaraderie because everybody's kind of operating at the same level and there is no prejudgment going on. One of the questions that I had when I was taking iTeach is what about our developmental students? Because we've got a large student population, right, that has real difficulty with reading and writing. And because the online course is mostly reading and writing, my thought process was how would it even be possible for a developmental student to take an online course, right? When they struggle even just writing the four papers in a traditional classroom, how can they take a course where everything is via written communication? Um, obviously, this is not for everybody, right? And for certain developmental students, uh, it's probably not a good fit to take an online course. But uh, the anecdotal evidence that I heard from some of the participants and the instructors in iTeach is that de developmental students actually uh, see a lot of growth over the course of an online course because, over the course of an online course, because uh, a sort of a quantity begets quality situation. Because everything is via written communication, they're writing a whole lot more than they would if all they're responsible for is just writing four big essays. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. It's kind of like an immersion, uh, an immersion situation, right? Like you're trying to learn a foreign language, right? The best thing to do is to be in an environment where all you can speak and hear is that language, right? So again, that's anecdotal, but I thought it was an interesting uh, point to share. So communicating specifically, right? The when and the where of communicating. On ground, obviously it's easy. We've got class, we've got office hours. If not, send me an email. Online is all asynchronous, so we need to establish clear parameters and expectations so the students know when they can contact us and what they can expect. Now, as we know, we've got these omnipresent, ubiquitous pocket computers on our persons at all times, which is wonderful because they allow us to communicate with other human beings on the other side of the planet whenever we want, right? And we can answer email uh, whenever we have a free minute. But the terrible thing is that we can answer email whenever we have a free minute, right? So, because of that, uh, we need to sort of consider the medium and make sure that while we are accessible, right, as instructors in our online courses, we don't want to be accessible all the time, because that would, that's not good for quality of life, right? So there's this uh, adage that I came across in doing my research for this, which is the shortest response time becomes the longest expected, 
right? So if your online students happen to email you at 3 o'clock in the morning and you happen to be on Pinterest at 3 o'clock in the morning, right, and you see that email come in, you're like, oh, I can deal with this right now. Boom. You send a response back. The students will be like, wow, this instructor really cares and I can email them anytime I want, right? And they'll get back to me immediately because, sent from my iPhone, I know that they get it as soon as I send it. So probably not something that you want to establish as far as uh, an expectation goes. Um, so clear parameters, right? I'll get back to you within 24 hours. If you don't hear from me within 24 hours and so on. Um, and I like to kind of think of it as sort of a hierarchy of, of communication methods. So in other words, if I have a course questions form, that's for public course related questions, right? Like you have any questions about assignments, instructions, material, whatever, ask that publicly in the forum so I can address everybody. If it's <coughs> private, right, grades, feedback, special accommodations, whatever, that's when Blackboard Messages is really useful. Blackboard Messages keeps the communication contained within the course, right, and still allows for private communication between instructor and student. Uh, in my online courses, I say um, public questions, obviously, for the forum, private messages for Blackboard Messages. If it's an emergency and I haven't gotten back to you in 24 hours, then feel free to email me because I get it on my phone. I'll get back to you right away, assuming it is, in fact, as urgent as you say it is. Okay. So kind of thinking, laying out a hierarchy for the students in terms of uh, how the communi communication works is, uh, is really useful in helping them to um, just succeed. So the how, right? So as we said ad nauseum at this point, right? in person we've got facial cues, we've got body language, we've got tone of voice. All of these things provide context, right? which allows us to interpret the speaker's meaning. Online, we have no such thing, right? So you guys are probably all familiar with netiquette, right? So netiquette refers to using uh, proper etiquette when communicating online, not writing things in all caps, right? Uh, not using emojis, right? Using proper punctuation and so on. So we want to provide students with a document. I think uh, IT has one. Provide students with a document that includes all those guidelines, and of course, lead by example. And it's kind of a personal thing. Uh, I also think it's really important to sort of show a certain degree of, of warmth in our written communications with one another. I'm always kind of surprised, like the number of emails that I encounter on a daily basis that are sort of just very terse and cold and kind of robotic. And obviously we want to be professional, right? But I don't think it's a lot to ask to include some warmth or some personality, right? To acknowledge the other person as a human being. So I probably shouldn't acknowledge this on camera, but um, whenever I get an email, right, that uh, starts like this, with just my name and no salutation, no hello or anything, it always makes me feel a little bit like I'm about to get in trouble, right? Maybe this is my own insecurity, right? But I think it's, it goes a long way, right, to say hello, right, when you start a correspondence with somebody, right? To say hello, to use people's names so that you acknowledge them, right, as a human being, and to show some kind of warmth, some personality, some patience, even when you're not feeling particularly patient, even when the question has been asked numerous times and answered numerous times in class. Um, and I think that's the mark of a good writer, right, that your in-person voice is kind of mirrored or reflected in your writing voice. So that's just me. There's an awesome article in your packets uh, by Kathleen Plant and Marilyn Aslan, and it's from uh, a journal called Nursing Education Perspectives, who better to know about caring than nurses. Uh, best practices for creating social presence and caring behaviors online. And one of their conclusions is, that faculty messages that are respectful, positive, encouraging, timely and frequent add to feelings of social presence and the reciprocal feelings of caring among students. Social presence refers to students feeling like they are connected and part of the learning environment. So I think communicating not only clearly but kindly is a great way to, uh, to help them do that. And this really brings us back to the whole humanization angle, right? Making the students feel like there is a real instructor on the other side of this computer who cares right, about their success. So online students are real people who depend upon us to provide an authentic, engaging, and human learning experience. And we need to treat them as such, okay? even though we're behind screens and even though it feels a little bit less real than the students we see face to face every day. All right, last category. Uh, know the technology. And this applies to students and to instructors. So there was an article that came out in 2001 by Mark Krensky called Digital Natives, Digital Immigrants. And what this uh, article implies or suggests is that anybody who was born post-1980 somehow intuitively knows how to use technology and how to navigate digital learning environments. And I'm sure we can all relate uh, to our students, right, that when we come into class, right, they're always heads down, phones out, at least in my experience. Uh, and so they're always on their phones and hyper-connected, 
right? And so because of that, I think it's easy to assume that they have this expertise, right, about technology, right? And they know how to use Snapchat and Instagram and Periscope and all these things that we may or may not be familiar with. But there is a distinct uh, difference between knowing how to use lifestyle technology, like Snapchat, watch YouTube videos, and so on, and professional and academic technology. Right? So just because students know how to use Snapchat, which is completely inscrutable, and I've read numerous articles about how it works, right? even though they know how to use Snapchat, right, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're equipped to use technology in a professional or an academic way. There's an article that came out, uh, I think you guys also have this one in your packet, uh, by the ECDL Foundation called The Digital Native Fallacy. And what they conclude is that young people do not inherently possess the skills for safe and effective use of technologies, and skills acquired informally are likely to be incomplete. Stu and this is backed up by practical testing in that report. Um, students tend to overestimate how good they are at using technology, because again, there's a big difference between apps and using technology in the workplace or in an academic setting. So all this to say is we can't assume that students intuitively know how to use these digital learning environments and will know how to navigate them, right, just because it's on the computer, right, and they're super excited <laughs> because they're millennials. Um, I know in my online, excuse me, in my uh, embedded composition classes, we have a, a computer lab available to us at all times. And so we spend, uh, you know, several days throughout the semester drafting and revising and that sort of thing. And I'm always very shocked at how, um, much of a struggle a lot of our students find basic things like typing, right? Like I take for granted that I took information processing in high school and can type as fast as I can think, right? But I can't imagine having to write a seven to nine page research paper typing out one word at a time. That must be excruciating. And so that's just one example. But we need to keep in mind that just because our students are young and, and hyper-connected with their smartphones, right, and know how to use all this newfangled technology, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to take to online courses like a fish to water, right? So the reason I stress this is because just because it's an online course doesn't mean we can kind of not worry about its design or how we uh, present the course material to the students. We've got to make it clear so that they know what to do and when to do it. So what are our responsibilities? As instructors, we need to know how to use and how to troubleshoot the software so that we can quickly identify and address problems. At Three Rivers, I guess this is probably true throughout the, uh, the community college system, uh, the minimum required level of training to teach an online course is the Getting Started with Blackboard Learn session, which is about 90 minutes or an hour. Um, and it's, it's really good. I learned a lot of stuff about Blackboard that I didn't know. It's actually very functionally capable. Um, not the greatest piece of software of all time, um, but it does have a lot of functionality. Um, and that's important because obviously we need to be functionally capable of operating on our students' level, right? So if we don't know how to use all the tools that we're making our students use, obviously it's going to be bad news. But I think we should try to go beyond, right, just the Word document, right, or just the minimum level required of training. So I've been experimenting in my own online courses with using screencasts, uh, narrated screencasts, videos. Um, I know that Pamela Carroll has had a lot of success using um, podcast or audio right, to provide feedback to individual students. Right? And obviously, as we know, right, reading an essay seems a lot more daunting than watching a movie. Right? So there's a great human connection right, that can be uh, incorporated when you use audio and video in your courses. As always, we're trying to give them a human experience, not just a computer experience. Uh, here's some uh, goofy screenshots of some of the screencasts that I've been do doing in my online courses. So you can see that this is really useful. It's not, um, it's not technologically difficult to set up. Um, I invested in a microphone and uh, a webcam. Not, not a huge monetary investment, but that helps to give me the high def quality and, uh, and all that sort of thing. And it's really cool because you can use this to sort of explain concepts or assignments, um, or even just to uh, address the students uh, as a group and provide encouragement and that sort of thing. Um, so obviously this gives them a real sense of the person right behind the course, which is what we're shooting for. So a couple things and then I want to do a little uh, painless activity. Um, there's a feature in Blackboard called the student view. And it's a little button and when you click on the student view, uh, you literally get to see the course from the student's per perspective. Right? So you see it without all the edit buttons and with all, all the functionality and bells and whistles that you see as the instructor building the course. So the student view is a really useful software tool, but I also think it's really useful to kind of think of the student view as a kind of reflective practice, right? And to not just think about it from the software perspective, but to think about our entire course, online or otherwise, to think about our entire courses 
from the student's perspective, right? Is it clear? It's clear to us because we're, we have multiple degrees, right? And we have a professor in front of our name, right? But it might not necessarily be clear to the students. So thinking about their perspective really helps to uh, ensure the quality of our instruction. There's a, uh, we talk about this in uh, composition all the time, right? We talk about how good writing always considers the reader's experience, right? If you are uh, writing a sentence and you know what you're trying to say, right? Because it's your idea and it's in your head, so you know exactly what you meant, right? But your, your uh, reader, it does not exist in your head, fortunately, right? And because of that, if they have a bad experience reading your sentence, if they find confusing ideas or misworded sentences or it goes on for too long or anything like that, they're going to stop reading very, very quickly. And so in my composition classes, we always talk about how the reader's experience is a priority because we have to make it unequivocally clear that what we are trying to say in our heads is what the reader is getting, right? And I think it's the same thing with online courses. Good instruction considers the student's experience, right? Not just our own experience. So to wrap up our four big areas, uh, to humanize our online courses, I recommend that we be actively present and participate in our courses, show up and teach, even on the interwebs. Use quality course design to keep everybody from getting confused or overwhelmed and keep everyone on the same page and having a good time. Communicate clearly and kindly, right, like human beings, talking to other human beings. And to know the technology, right, so that we can, so that we don't have to worry about how things work. We can just worry about the teaching aspect of it. So, how are we doing on time? Perfect. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is show you example, an example of a couple of online courses. And then we'll leave some time for questions. So here is uh, an online course. Um, what do you notice about this online course? Spoiler alert, this is a bad example. Lime green font, not only lime green font, but Comic Sans, right? Lime green font, right? Underlined and probably bolded, yep. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's hard on the eyes, not a good experience. What else do you notice? Assignments look kind of disorganized with folders. And right, no sense of organization yeah. at all, right? You've got the syllabus here, then you've got a week one folder with a content material, and then you've got an assignment, right? So everything's all over the place, right? What else? If the title of the class was on there, we wouldn't know. Okay, good. So this is a, a bad practice because when I opened this course, this is right when I first clicked into the course from the, the hub or whatever, uh, it took you right to the course content folder, right? Best practices suggest that you should open on the announcements section because the announcements, right, is the latest and greatest information that you want the students to see first. If you open on this cluster of, of course material, right, it's going to be uh, confusing and it adds an extra layer of friction because they have to click on the announcements tab to see whatever's new. What else? The menu's kind of a mess on the side. The menu is a disaster. <laughs> exactly. Right? There's no sense of order or organization. Right? Uh, you've got multiple links. I think there's mail and email. Right? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. You've got two announcements links. Right? Some of these links are broken. Right? So they, they don't work properly. Right? So you get the idea. There's very little chance that this would be a good experience right, for a student. Right? I know if I was trying to take this course, I would feel like maybe I'm not as smart as I thought. Right? Um, so this is not a good experience. Let me show you the example of a course that does use best practices. Right? You can see this is the um, best, best, excuse me, best practices uh, demo course for faculty uh, that Toby enrolled me in for the purposes of this workshop. Thanks, Toby. Um, so you can see we open right on the announcements tab, right? There's bulleted lists, right? There's bold to indicate the most important information. It tells you what to do, right? What to do next. The course menu is super organized, right? There are um, specific links for specific types of content, right? There's an exams link for exams. As opposed to over here, right? You've got information, right? Which is completely inscrutable and vague. You've got tools. Look at all the great tools. Right? Super overwhelming, no good. So a lot of this might seem obvious, especially if you've taught online before, but I think it's imperative right, that we consider everything from our students' perspective. Right? We know what we meant right, when we put it up there, but it's not necessarily true that the students will understand um, what we meant to do. Make sense? 
Okay, how are we doing on time? Pretty good. We've got about 20 minutes for, uh, for questions. There is a class coming in right at 1, so we should probably get out a few minutes ahead of time. Um, but what questions do you guys have, or those of you who have taught, what is your experience with them? Can you um, elaborate on your grading once you get the assignments in? Sure. Do you, like, do you read off the screen? Do you print? Do you... Yeah, I'm still experimenting because I've only done a couple courses so far, but the grading situation, and we can hear how uh, the rest of you do it too, that I've taught online before. Um, I will say that I didn't used to use Grade Center in like my regular classes, but uh, using it for an online course I find is really helpful and reduces a lot of friction. So creating an assignment in Blackboard, I can probably not um, Creating an assignment in Blackboard and assigning it a certain number of points uh, makes it really easy to sort of grade the uh, assignments right within Blackboard, just go through one at a time. You can put comments in there. There is an inline grading thing, like there's a marker tools and stuff where you can mark up the, uh, the students' papers. Um, and I haven't used that too much. Um, I will say that Grade Center is, is useful in terms of just getting through all the assignments quickly. For formal essays, I do go through the whole rigmarole of saving them to my personal computer and uh, grading them with track changes in Word. Um, the thing about grading, I don't want to have to worry about printing out a whole bunch of essays because <laughs> uh, that would be terrible for me. Um, but using track changes allows you to provide inline comments. You guys familiar with track changes? Okay. It allows you to include comments and that sort of thing. Um, I find that, for me, I'm a pretty big computer nerd, as you may or may not be able to tell. Uh, and so I know how to use all the, the keyboard shortcuts and like the macros and stuff so I can keep my fingers on the keyboard as opposed to having to mouse around to each part where I want to put a comment in. Mm -hmm. So I can use um, the arrow keys and I have a bunch of keyboard shortcuts keyboards, whoa, keyboard shortcuts for all those common comments like awkward sentence, comma splice, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I can hit semicolon CS and it pops out and just says comma splice to save me some time. Um, I know that um, I've been trying to get away from, or I've been thinking about, since John and I had a conversation last week, I've been thinking about getting away from doing sort of the line by line grading because it is kind of very time consuming. Um, but uh, that's how I do it. That's kind of a rambling answer. But track changes for formal essays, discussion boards, and minor assignments and that sort of thing right within Blackboard. Does that answer your question, Fred? No, it does. You wondering anything else? That's good. The other thing you can put right in the discussion board is a rubric. And yeah. You, you put your rubric in, and as you're reading through it, you can assign points, and they see right where they got points or lost mm -hmm. points. And yeah, right. You can include a rubric right within Blackboard, and obviously that's uh, very useful in helping the students know exactly what they're going to be grading on and what you're going to be looking for. And then as far as the actual grading process goes, it's just a matter of, of addressing the rubric. Yeah. That's cool. Yes? Can you, that, um, you can make that any way you want to. You can include the course menu on the left here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can rearrange things, add things, subtract things. I like to take out everything that I'm not going to use, right? Because it's just noise. Uh, but yeah, you can arrange those. You can change uh, the labels, right? I want to make sure that the links work and stuff. But yeah, um, in my course over the summer, I had a, a blog area, Mr. Marvin's blog area, where I posted all my videos and, and screencasts and stuff. So yeah, you can customize that however you want. It's not going to, uh, it's always going to look like Blackboard, but the actual content and stuff, you can kind of change it as you see fit. What else? Sal? I don't understand your personal time. Do you deal with this particular essay? So I have a Tuesday night three hour class. So mm -hmm. I interact with those students once a week. The right. rest of the time is planning whenever it works in my life, it works. When you do this, how do you make that, are you required to get on that machine? every single day and be a part of that class? I think that's going to vary from instructor to instructor. And I think that whatever works for you uh, is fine, as long as you're not, it's not like once a week that you're logging in. Um, whatever works for you, I think, is fine, as long as it's communicated to the students. So if you physically can't get on your computer on Sundays, that's fine. I think you just make that a very clear policy, right? I will not be on the course on Sundays. And then they know. Um, I will say for my courses, I do uh, set the expectation that I will be logging into the course uh, once a day at least, right? And my response time, I think, again, is 24 hours. If I don't get back to you in 24 hours, then you can um, you can send me an email. Do you see what time you're going to be on? Um, no, I haven't really gotten into that yet. And that kind of reminds me of, of uh, how to integrate office hours with uh, the online courses, which I haven't totally figured out yet. 
I've been thinking about, and I didn't get around to it this semester, but I've been thinking about using some kind of chat software or an app and saying like, uh, once or twice a week at this time, I will be in the chat room, right? And anybody can kind of show up at that time. Um, I haven't tried that yet, but I think it could be cool. It's got some potential. Uh, yeah? I use um, Skype for my office. You do? Yeah, and that works really well. Yeah. So do you, how do you, does it work? Are you, uh, is it video or just chat? Um, video. Video. And um, we use it mostly, you could use it for anything, but mostly um, when we're editing papers. Mm -hmm. So my student will have their paper, I'll have their paper, and I'll have them read through it together with me. So we have nice. like a virtual workshop. Yeah, and I know that WebEx is kind of built into, I haven't tried WebEx, um, and I don't really know what it does, but it's built into to Blackboard, and uh, I think that allows you to do sort of one-on-one -on -one conferencing with the students also. You can also, Dare I say, give out your phone number. Um, I, don't, I know I do have not done that. Um, but the, the Harrisburg Area Community College uh, presenters at the Tyga conference said that they regularly give out their phone numbers, and it's very infrequent that the student will actually use it. Because that's super weird, right? Calling your instructor. Um, but, you know, texting, everybody loves to text. Um, and they said that they frequently have, you know, regular, long, back and forth text conversations, you know. Um, so it's kind of whatever works for you and whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, John. Yeah, and yeah, we, we talked about this before, but I mean, one of the things that, that I think is an ongoing kind of balancing act is all the things you're talking about to increase human presence mm -hmm. are all huge time sucks. So, like mm -hmm. Skyping with every student, that takes a long time. Very oh, right? mm -hmm. um, if you do you podcasts with every student or on uh, paper feedback yeah. for every single student, that takes a long time. So, I mean, it's a, I always find it, it's, like, it is kind of a balance because you, you want to have that humanizing piece. But, I mean, like, for the grading thing, we, we talked about this before, right? I don't do line by line grading anymore because mm -hmm. it's too much of a time suck and they don't care. So, I'll do summative comments in a really detailed rubric, and then anybody who wants the line by line stuff, they can come talk to me. I'll give them my line by line requests. Yeah, but, um, you know, I have three students who want that. Yeah. So, it, it's, it's a weird balance because I, you can actually, like you said, for your summer class, right? You can spend, like, all of your free time just, like, hanging out, mm -hmm. doing awesome things for your students. But again, you know, if you have other things to do, that's sometimes difficult. Yeah, for sure. And that's been my experience, too. And the good thing is, it seems like, and again, I've only taught two fully online courses at this point, um, but it seems like there is a, a lot of upfront costs, especially because you do have to, even if you have, you know, your time-tested, brilliant teaching techniques and assignments and stuff, you still have to translate those for an online uh, environment. And so there can be a big sort of upfront time investment. But hopefully, you know, when you figure out what works over the course of several semesters, you know, you can reuse videos, right, and that sort of thing, um, and other uh, other course material, and you can refine it, right, from semester to semester. And uh, so hopefully, you can kind of build a, a wealth of, of content as you go. Rick, you had something? Yeah, just getting back to the question over here, I think it's, um, it's important to sign on every day and just check the numbers, you know, especially if the student has sent a message to you or something has been posted on them questions about the course on the discussion board. You know, quite often, you know, for example, I have uh, online quizzes. You know, the students are always not often go the quiz because of the and they can only be sent that form. Yeah. And you know, if I look like days to days, then I can quiz my class and mm -hmm. you know, issues. So I think it's just it's like check the email form. So yep. you know, it's on the blackboard, just check every day. Yeah. Yeah. And like email, you can spend as much time as you allow yourself to spend on yeah. it. Yeah. So it's good to have those those parameters because you do want to you know, maintain your own quality of life. And while it's, like with my summer course, like John said, you know, I had the time, right, to spend all afternoon working on this one individual course and stuff. But obviously, um, that's not really sustainable and during a regular semester. Yes? Is there a way that you need to be certified to um, be able to teach online? Uh, the minimum required training for Three Rivers is that getting Blackboard, get, excuse me, getting started with Blackboard session. Um, I think it's, it's scheduled to be two hours, but like when I did it, it was just Kevin and me. Um, so it only took about 90 minutes. Uh, that's the minimum level required uh, for training. And then on top of that, if you're teaching an online course for the first time, you do need to do a proposal for curriculum. So you need to do a, a proposal form, and you also need to uh, meet with Ken, uh, Ken Barfield and show him uh, at least two weeks of your course uh, so that he can see, you know, make sure check for the best practices and that sort of thing. And that's so, just the school? Um, I, I hope it's consistent well, throughout the uh, community Gateway system. says that there's something called I Teach. I Teach Essentials, yeah, that's the professional development course that I took last semester. That is above and beyond. Um, it does have a cost, 
Uh, there's a discount for community college faculty, but it does cost hundreds of dollars to do. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's nine weeks, and that is less about here's how you do things in Blackboard and more really about the pedagogy of online courses. Has anybody else taken IT? Yeah? I took it back when it was free. Oh, great job. I was registered for one, but I had low enrollment, so it got canceled. Oh, that's a bummer, yeah. And I'll say the other great thing about IT, not to plug IT, uh, well, it was really good, uh, is that it allowed me to experience an online course from a student's perspective. Because that's what I teach is, right? It's an online course that you are a student in. Um, and the, there's a, a snippet from the Inside Higher Ed survey on faculty attitudes about technology in your packets. And I think that survey says that 27% of faculty have taken an online course, which is not that many. And if you haven't taken an online course, it's really difficult to kind of really put yourself in the student's shoes. So that's another great thing about iTeach beyond any of the, the content itself is that it lets you experience what taking an online course is like. And you really see, wow, the people that are the instructors in this course are super clear at all times right, and very consistent and that sort of thing. So um, that was my, my favorite takeaway from it. Yeah. But the iTeach is above and beyond the minimum of required training. I, I was just curious how you. Um foster your peer review sessions, you know, online. That, yeah. That's always a big question because it's not great. we do a lot of peer review and writing course in our composition classes mm -hmm. and, you know, we facilitate that. Yeah. And obviously, this would be students working with one another, mm -hmm. giving the, them the autonomy. Yeah, I mean, peer reviews, how, how many English faculty do we have in the house? Uh, about half, okay. So, um, peer reviews are super hard in person, right, to make them do a good job with it. Uh, so, online, kind of even doubly so. Um, what I've done is just try to be very specific in terms of what I want them to look for, right? So you could, and this is probably obvious to us, right? But um, you don't want to just say, okay, read each other's drafts, give each other feedback, and that's it, right? There was a Tyka, uh, Tyka session last semester um, about peer reviews, and one of the things that the presenter really stressed is giving specific criteria, like circle the thesis statement, make sure that the sources do this, this, and this. So I've been using peer review sheets, which I don't usually do. Usually I just explain the criteria orally in my on-ground classes. But I've been providing them with um, peer review sheets that have like five specifics to look for. Um, I have them post drafts of their essay as threads in the discussion board. And all students are able to see these threads? Yeah, or all students, students can see them. Students. No, I don't. I haven't That's bothered. Specific. Yeah, I know that um, Todd Berry, who was the online curriculum leader for the past three years, I think, he tried like pairing people, right. and it was just it seemed like it was okay. way too much work. So yeah, what I do is everybody posts their rough draft by this time. Um, everybody has to complete at least two peer review sheets, sheets for two different uh, classmates, and just look for people who haven't gotten any feedback yet. And it's been pretty smooth as far as everybody getting feedback. If somebody doesn't get enough feedback, um, they either a don't care or b they'll let you know and um, you know you can address it. Uh, but that's the way I've been doing it. Just trying to be really specific about the criteria to look for in peer reviews. Um, and again, making it easy for them to, to do it as opposed to just, oh, give them feedback, okay. I thought it was great. It's not good. Does that help at all? Yes, absolutely. Anything else? Perfect. Well, again, there's a 1 o'clock class coming in, so this will give us a little time to migrate. Thank you guys very much. I know it's right before spring break, and I really appreciate your time. If you need to stick around and talk to me, feel free to do that. We can go to my office and have a great break. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you very much.